The story takes place when I was 19 years old. At the time, I was dating a guy, and it had only been a couple of months. My parents had gone to a trip to visit family in the US. I grew up in Mexico. I decided to sneak my then boyfriend into the house to spend a week with me while they were gone. I never would have expected what happened. My parents left me their car, my first ever, and my boyfriend, who used to be a professional level bodybuilder and trainer, knew a lot of shady people. One night he tells me this friend wants to meet up in a city. It's about a half hour-ish drive from the town I lived in. As I was the one with the car, I was down to drive him and meet his friend. We met at a shady bar in a so-so part of the city. I was instantly uncomfortable with this guy. He was too familiar, too comfortable, too obnoxious to everyone, myself included. All of a sudden, after a private talk outside between him and my then boyfriend, my boyfriend approaches me and says that we need to give him a ride back to my place. I'm sorry, I'm not comfortable with this. He was a bit nervous as he tells me quietly to shush. This isn't someone we can afford to offend. I ask why he can't drive himself, to which I'm told he's too intoxicated and needs a private setting to talk. As dumb as I was, I ended up agreeing. I was very uncomfortable and had a terrible feeling the whole way home, which my boyfriend drove. We get home, they sit outside, and suddenly this man starts demanding I cook him dinner. I was a very obstinate teen. I hated, and still do, being told what to do. As I began to deny him, my ex-boyfriend looks at me, a bit pale, and shakes his head. I go in, fuming at that order and feeling bossed around in my own home, and then I make them a simple dinner. After his friend left, I learned from my ex-boyfriend that that guy was the head narco of our city. I mean, the head honcho. I was livid he brought this guy to my family's home. He was very pushy, and without words, slightly threatening. So I strongly feel that if I had made a mistake, it very well could have ended terribly for me. This happened to me about two to three years ago. When I was 16, I used to work at a fast food restaurant. I live in a place where we have all seasons. At this point in time, it was winter, so it got dark pretty early, like around 5 to 6 p.m. I was called to come into work this particular day, but the weather was kind of bad, causing us to not have any customers. As a result, we had to close the store early. It was about 5.30 p.m. when my manager left, locking the store and making me wait outside for my ride. About 20 minutes had passed since she left, and I was really cold. So I decided, regrettably, that I would walk to a friend's house just a few blocks away. About a 10-minute walk, and I would wait for my ride there. The store I worked at was on a busy street that was near a residential neighborhood, as I walk away from the store, I started walking down the residential street behind the store. I was walking on the sidewalk to the left of the street, as the sidewalk on the other side had woods behind it. It was convenient as well, because on the left side of the street was my store, and there were no street lights. I walked about three-fourths of the block when I got this feeling that I was being watched. The neighborhood was really dark, and at this point, I'd pretty much reached the end of the block, and I was getting ready to cross the street when I noticed the silhouette of someone walking on the right side of the road near the woods. They were about 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 10, looked to be maybe 180 or 200 pounds. I couldn't make out any features though. I'm the type of person who's very aware of their surroundings and slightly paranoid as I've been followed, almost kidnapped, stalked and whatever else, you get the gist. So when I noticed him, I stopped walking and immediately got a sick feeling in my stomach. The man then noticed me and proceeded to walk slowly and yell out to me. He yells, 
Yo, come here. I want to talk to you. No, I'm good. I'm only 16. I yell back. I then turn around and start walking back to my store. He continues to yell things at me, trying to convince me to come to him. At that point, something in me told me to run, and I did just that. As I'm running, I know I shouldn't have, but I turned my head to see if he was actually chasing me, and to my horror, he was. So I turned up the speed and run as fast as I can. Thankfully, as I reached the store, my ride had pulled up, so I ran to the car. As I tried to get in, the door was locked. It took about 20 seconds for them to unlock the car, and it felt like hours. Eventually, I got in and just broke down, crying. I'm not gonna lie, I'm kind of out of shape, so my back was hurting from breathing so hard, and I was all frazzled. This was the first time I was chased on foot, and let me tell you, it's so much more scary, surreal, and intense being chased on foot than someone chasing you by car. Still, to this day, I have added trauma from this incident, and it makes it hard to go anywhere by myself, especially in the dark. So, to the man that chased after me in the dark, let's not meet again. My three-year-old son suffered from chronic ear infections last year, which led him to having high fevers. I slept with him on this particular night because I needed to give him Tylenol throughout the night to keep his fever down and to keep him comfortable. I set my alarm to wake me up at around 2.30 a.m. When I woke up, I went into the kitchen to get the Tylenol. I noticed a bright light shining into the apartment from our deck door which also illuminated part of the woods behind the apartment. When I went over to see what it was, it turned out to be a car with those bright LED headlights in the parking lot to the far back right of the apartment. I figured they were dropping someone off. I saw the movement of what resembled a dog walking around near the woods. I started to think that the lady who usually walks her dog, the cute little corgi, in that area purposely faced her car in that direction so she could see while she walked her dog. As it got closer, I realized that there was nobody out there walking a dog, and there was no dog. I don't know what it was that I saw, but I'll describe it in the best way I can. At first, it looked just like a dog, corgi size, but as it walked closer, it looked like your average house cat. Then it looked like a black bear, and then it looked like a koala. I live in New Jersey, and there are no wild koalas here. At this point, my heart is pounding out of my chest, and I'm scared. The fear I felt was like a primal type of fear that I've never felt before. I ran to my bedroom to wake up my boyfriend, and I shook him awake very roughly. I said, you gotta come see this. He was a bit annoyed with me. When we look outside together, we see this thing getting closer and it looks like a skunk now. White stripe down the center with a perky, fluffy tail. I said, oh, it's just a skunk, with a little chuckle. I felt a bit embarrassed that I woke him up over a damn skunk, but at that moment, I also felt relieved. However, I was mistaken. As it walked, it looked as if it was struggling to find a form. I thought it looked like it was falling apart, but also coming back together again at the same time. I know this doesn't make sense, but it's hard to find the words for what we saw. After the skunk formation, it looked like a person crawling on the ground with some type of fur or skin attached to them around the leg. Then it changed again, and it looked like a raccoon, groundhog, black bear, cat, koala, deer, and skunk. The part that stuck out to me the most was that whatever it was seemed to be coming apart or shedding, but at the same time, it was growing. Whoever had their headlights on turned them off as it went deeper into the woods. This happened pretty quick. I'd say it was only about a couple of minutes from start to finish. 
My boyfriend ended up going back to bed, but I couldn't sleep after that, so I grabbed a flashlight and shined it into the woods to see if I could see it again, but it was gone. I also opened the door to see if I could hear anything, but I couldn't. It was very quiet. I had a very hard time going back to sleep that night. My boyfriend wasn't scared, but he was confused and stunned. He didn't know what to make of it. I was scared and creeped out. I know if I hadn't woken him up to see it for himself, he most likely wouldn't believe me and would have chalked it all up to me being groggy from just waking up, or possibly it just being an animal. Unfortunately, I know what I saw, and I'll never forget it. I was 23 and had a long distance boyfriend. He would come and see me, and on this day we parked outside of a natural trail and fooled around in the car briefly before I exited. None of the vehicles in the lot appeared to be occupied, but I was wrong. I'm about to get out of the car and decide to grab my knife out of my bag before I start walking the trail. I normally wouldn't do that. I also decided to put a bigger t-shirt over my tank top. I said goodbye to my boyfriend and started down the trail. I wanted to walk before going home. This isn't a hidden trail. This is a populated area. If you run about a minute down the road from the trail entrance, you're outside a business. As I'm walking, I start to sense someone is behind me. I'm currently holding my knife in front of my body. I continue walking and finally look back to see a middle-aged man following me. As I pick up speed, he does as well. I tell myself I'm being paranoid. It's the middle of the day. How would he even do anything to me? Because he continues to follow and I see a bench coming up, I decide that the best thing to do is to hurry up to the bench that's facing the trail and hold my knife out in front of me in an obvious way. I cannot express to you how shocked I was to see when I sat down and he saw my knife. He put an even larger knife into his pocket. I couldn't believe it. He saw the face I made and he ran off immediately to an adjacent trail that was deeper into the wooded area. I got up and started running the main trail he'd followed me down. When I got to the parking lot, there was one vehicle. A truck, running, with no one inside. I'm guessing this was his vehicle. I continued running until I was in the middle of town. I don't know what to make of this. Surely if he got me there, someone would have heard or seen it. Are people really that bold? I also think he may have confused me for a sex worker, because he may have seen me in the car. Are there any thoughts? I'd flown to Denver, Colorado for a business meeting. We'd signed a new client, and I was going there to learn their processes and systems before we went live handling their freight. I'm a flatlander and have been warned that people visiting Denver for the first time often developed symptoms of altitude sickness. So when I started feeling bad at the end of my second day, I brushed it off as nothing too serious and went to bed. At some point after dark, I woke up dizzy, delirious, and in pain, and I knew I needed help. I'm naturally hard-headed and have a great huge helping of social anxiety, so actually asking for help is something I'm almost physically incapable of doing. But I needed it, so I split the difference, and instead of picking up the phone and dialing 911, or even calling down to the front desk to croak out a help me, I picked up my phone and googled after hours urgent care, thinking that surely, in a place the size of Denver, there'd be some sort of walk-in clinic open at night. And what do you know? There was, sort of. 
so I carefully copied the address into my Waze app and, squinting against the light that felt like daggers being shoved into my eyes, I stumbled through getting dressed and making my way down to the parking lot, then followed the voice prompts across the city to a place called, wait for it, after hours urgent care. I got there, parked the car, stumbled to the door, walked in, and then realized to my horror and dismay that it was on the second floor and there was no way I was going to be able to crawl up the stairs. I was leaning against the wall, contemplating my fate, when there was a ding, and the wall disappeared. I caught my balance in time to realize that I'd been leaning against the elevator door, found a large friendly button with a number two on it, pressed it, and closed my eyes for the ride. The ride up took somewhere between 30 seconds and 30 years. Logic tells me that it was probably the former, but my memory insists that it was closer to the latter. In any case, the next time I managed to pry my eyes open, I was slowly making my way through the door to the check-in counter, closing one eye so I could focus and carefully writing my name on the clipboard. A short time skip later, I was sitting in a chair against the wall, hearing my name called. I got up, followed the average of the two people leading me down the hall, and time skipped again, ending up sitting on the crinkly paper-covered exam bed while my vitals were taken. The nurse asked me some questions, which I must have answered, and turned to walk out. I begged her to turn off the lights, and she did, and I fell back onto the crinkly paper and passed out. Sometime later, the lights flicked back on. I screamed. The lights went back out. A doctor came in, asked me some questions about my reason for being in town, business, and my drug use, which was not, and then left again. I passed out again. And then there was a group of people standing, silhouetted in the doorway, wearing gowns and goggles and gloves and face masks, and very pointedly not approaching my bed. One of them spoke. Mr. Adams, who drove you here tonight? I drove myself, I replied. Okay, we need to get you to the hospital. Can you drive yourself, or should we call you an ambulance? Give me the address. I'm okay. And then I could hear the silhouettes in the doorway whispering to themselves. After a minute, the voice came back and said, We'll be right back. I passed out. A while later, the lights flicked on. I screamed. The lights flicked off. Two people squeezed in with a gurney, and I ended up on it. The lights were still stabbing me in the head, so I threw my arm over my eyes for the ride down the hallway. And then we were at the elevator, and the gurney would fit on the elevator, or the two people would fit on the elevator. And then I was in the elevator, and they were gone. Then the elevator doors opened, and they were there again. And then out the door we went. It was all so confusing. There was then an ambulance, but we couldn't get to it. There was a shrubbery in the way. The driver had seen Monty Python, the EMT hadn't. She thought I was delirious when I started quoting the knights who say knee. I probably was. The driver started quoting back. The tech started losing her mind. It was a good time. I passed out. I woke up being rolled through an ER. I passed out. I woke up on a different bed. I passed out. I woke up in an MRI. I passed out. I woke up back on the bed. At some point, I must have texted my wife. Something like, I'm in the hospital, but don't worry. I'm fine. And she found a friend of mine who lived in the area, and he started calling and driving around to hospitals looking for me. I don't know how long he searched, but he eventually found me. So I'm fine, right? Right. Maybe not. Apparently, I have meningitis, so that's fun. Now, the next part of this I remember, very concerned-looking people started explaining to me the difference between viral and bacterial meningitis. So, Mr. Adams, if this is viral meningitis, you just need to get rest and get plenty of fluids, and it'll clear up on its own in a few days. And if it's bacterial meningitis, we need to start you on an IV antibiotics right away or there's a good chance you will die. 
So how do we know which is which, I ask? Well, we can wait a few hours and see if you get worse. Or we can jab a needle into your spine and suck some fluid out for testing. Let's just wait, I reply. Or we could jab a needle into your spine, he asked again. Do I seem to be getting worse, I asked. No, but if you do. If I do, you can start me on antibiotics, I questioned. Yes, but if we wait, let's wait. Or again, we could jab a needle into your spine, he persists. Do we have to, I asked. Well, no, but this went on for some time, and I eventually gave in and let them stick a needle into my spine. Good news, it's not bacterial, the doctor informed me. Yay? I quizzically asked. You can go home, he told me. No, I can't. I'm over a thousand miles from home. You can go back to your hotel then. Shouldn't I stay a while? No. Just take it easy and drink plenty of water, and you'll be okay in a few days. Cool, cool, I told him. So my friend helped me sign out and drove me to get my rental car, which was still parked at the clinic. Then he followed me to my hotel, where we dropped off the rental. He then took me to get some pizza. That's taking it easy, right? I somehow ended up back at the hotel and passed out again. I woke up in time to go to the next day's meetings. Now, the doctor had said to take it easy and drink plenty of fluids. Fluids are easy, plenty of bottled water. Easy is unfortunately subjective. I'm a delivery guy. I'm used to loading and unloading trucks and moving stuff around in warehouses. So a day of meetings and walking around is pretty easy to me. So I went to my meetings and I walked around the customer's warehouse, and I did what I could to learn their systems. And I had splitting headaches, dizziness, nausea, delirium, basically all the things that meningitis causes. So I just wrote it off as the virus that I'd been told would go away in a few days. And the next day, I checked out of the hotel, and I drove to turn in my rental car and took a shuttle to the airport to fly home. The shuttle driver took pity on me and helped me load and unload my bag, and I trudged into the airport to check in. Walking into the airport was like a bad acid trip. The entire building was spinning around me. I spotted a check-in kiosk, made my way to it, and maybe because my brain wasn't functioning properly, maybe because the machine wasn't working right, I couldn't get checked in. There was a line at the one-staffed counter so I made my way to the end of it and sat down on the floor. The next thing I was aware of was an elderly gentleman in a bright red jacket leaning carefully over me and saying, for what was probably the second or third time, Sir, do you require medical assistance? Yes, yes, I think I do. And I was lying down. And then I was being loaded into an ambulance. I passed out. I woke up. I was being rolled into another hospital, and over the course of the next few hours, I learned the extent of my fuck-up. Apparently, when you have a needle jabbed into your spine and are told to take it easy for a few days, what you're actually supposed to do is stay in bed so your spine can heal. When you don't stay in bed, your cerebrospinal fluid just sort of leaks out of your spine through the hole they poked. Reduced pressure in your skull causes splitting headaches, nausea, dizziness, light sensitivity, basically all the things I've been dealing with and writing off as meningitis. To fix the leak, they had to do what's called a blood patch, which entails drawing blood from your hand and then pumping that blood into your spine by jabbing another needle into it. Sounds brutal, but the headaches and nausea started fading within minutes, like magic. I was still sick as a dog, but not apparently in imminent danger of my head exploding. Someone managed to get in touch with my wife, who called my brother, who booked emergency flights for them to come and get me out of the hospital, and I spent the next several days recuperating in another hotel before I was well enough to fly home.
When I first got out of the army, I was in a relationship with a guy in the 3rd Ranger Battalion. His name was Jim. He and I had an apartment together, and I thought I loved him. So instead of going back to my home in Nebraska, I stayed in Columbus, Georgia. Our relationship started out with him being what I thought was protective over me. Even though I was very attractive at the time, I had very low self-esteem because of an assault I'd experienced while I was living in the barracks and the bullying I endured afterward. Things moved very quickly. In fact, we were inseparable from the night we met. Anytime another man looked at me, he would get very confrontational toward that guy. I felt safe and protected by this. It made me feel special. I thought he must really value me if he would get so upset by a guy looking my way at first. Soon, when we would be out at a bar, he would get hammered every time and acted very nasty towards me if he thought I was looking at another guy. This would cause bitter fights, and I would always end up in a fetal position in bed, sobbing. But still, I stayed. The next day, he would always apologize, making excuses about being because he was so drunk, but then he would proceed to explain to me why what I had done was wrong. It wasn't long before I found myself totally isolated from my friends and family, because he was so insecure he made me take all of my phone calls on speakerphone. My family begged me to leave, but I was afraid I couldn't get by on my own. Then one night, we came home from the bar in the usual fashion, him screaming in my face and me sobbing. I told him I was going to get a room at a motel, and he lost his mind. He yanked the keys out of the ignition and threw them into the wood line. He then got out of my car and proceeded to kick in the front quarter panel of my car. He used so much force, the hinges to the passenger door were bent. I told the insurance company it was a hit and run, or I never would have been able to get the damage fixed. He screamed at me to get inside the apartment, but I couldn't unlock the door without my keys, which he blamed me for. He then grabbed me and started shoving me into the front door, first by my shoulders, then with his hands around my throat, screaming, Can't you see how much I love you? No, no, I can't, I rasped. He let go, and I fell to the ground in a heap. That night, I had finally had enough. I was finally so angry that I didn't feel afraid anymore. That morning, while he was sleeping it off, I began to make plans. I started by telling him he had to leave and move back into the barracks. When he refused, I had to get his chain of command involved to make him leave the apartment and go back to live in the barracks, on someone's couch, in the street, anything, just as long as it wasn't with me. He stopped me mercilessly. I filed for an OP, but he bullied me into dropping it. I knew I would never be free from him if I stayed so my parents sent me money via Western Union. This was in 2002. I rented a Penske truck and a trailer, got help from my neighbor guy friends to load it up as soon as the sun set, and I brought it from where I'd hidden it. My best chance was to leave under the cover of darkness. I was really sick that night. I was running a fever of 103 degrees, but I knew it had to be then. It couldn't wait. I just told myself that I had to get out of the city limits, then I could pull over and sleep a bit. I figured I would just drive as much as I could and then rest when I couldn't push any harder. I put my puppy in the cab of the truck with me, towed my car behind it, and left. I don't know how, except through divine intervention. But somehow, I managed to drive non-stop from Fort Benning, Georgia, to my parents' home in rural Nebraska. I stopped only for fuel, at which time I would feed, water, and walk my little dog, Scruffy, use the facilities and get what food and drink I could afford on my meager budget. I drove 14 hours and pulled into my parents' drive at around 10 a.m. CST. I crashed on their old couch and slept for nearly 24 hours straight. 
I still hoped for nothing but pain and suffering for him. He turned me onto pills, then coke, then crack, all while he was on active duty. He was a scumbag of a soldier and a man. He reached out to me on social media a couple of years ago. I told him what a steaming piece of shit he was and to rot in hell. It felt amazing, even after all these years, to say that to him and have him be the one stammering. I'm actually glad he reached out to me and gave me the opportunity to verbally rip him to shreds. I'm not afraid of you anymore, Jim. Let's not ever meet again. This one isn't huge, but it is real, and my husband and I think about it a lot. One time I was at urgent care to get an injury checked out. My husband was with me, as he usually is for anything medical. The waiting room when you walk in through the door has a long counter at the front, chairs surrounding a TV to the right, and on the left, there's a little divot in the wall where more chairs can rest in front of a bathroom door. It's a single-person bathroom with no window and only one door. We were sitting in some of the chairs close to the bathroom door. It was kind of in its own micro hallway, and the only exit from walking out of the bathroom was to walk past my husband and I. After sitting there for a while, a man walks in with his wife through the front door of the waiting room. They don't go to the check-in counter, but rather talk right in front of the door for about 30 seconds, maybe a minute. I didn't catch what they were talking about. The woman nods and leaves through the front door, and the man pauses to look around the room once he's alone. I assumed she was dropping him off to get checked out. His eyes meet the door to the bathroom, and he walks straight there instead of checking in, going inside, and then locking the door. My husband and I continue to wait there. Five minutes pass. Ten. Fifteen. 20. We waited there for a long time, and he never came out. However, I think we've all had times where we spent a good hour in the bathroom, so we just assumed maybe he had a stomach bug. Later, a woman from the waiting room goes up to the bathroom door to use it. After the man had been in there for about 30 minutes, she opens the door, no problems. The lock suddenly wasn't engaged. She goes in to use the restroom, coming out a few minutes later and going back to her seat. My husband and I looked at each other confused. He went to look in the bathroom, and the man wasn't there. There were no other windows or doors to exit from. The man was just gone, without a trace. We never did figure out where he went, but we do think about it fairly often. I was in a smallish fishing boat charter that sank a little less than 12 miles from a Caribbean island in the Atlantic. From the first sign of trouble to looking straight down at the boat slowly sinking beneath the surface was only about 10 minutes time. Trust me when I say that's an image I'll never forget. A white sport fisher being swallowed by the dark blue beneath me. When boats sink, they sink. Somewhere in the chaos, the captain called his friends in the marina before the boat sank, so we waited there, just drifting for a while, collecting any floating debris we could hang on to. Fortunately, we had life vests on, otherwise I'd have no doubt we'd all be dead. Two hours pass. Nobody comes by to pick us up. Clouds and rain are more frequent, so we lose sight of the island occasionally and I finally convince everyone to agree to start swimming towards the island. I know the best thing to do is stay together and not move, but the island didn't seem too far away, and it was obvious to me that nobody was going to find us at this point. Just as we start slowly moving, a helicopter comes and hovers somewhere between us and the island, presumably over the coordinates the captain gave his friends. I swim my ass off towards that thing, and in doing so, lose sight of the captain and first mate. 
So now it's just me and my sister. And then the helicopter leaves. That sucked. But, given the weather, there was almost zero chance of them spotting us unless we were right under them. We decide our best chance at survival is to keep swimming towards the island. The whole time it's rainy, cloudy, rough seas, and much of the time we can't see the island at all, and we use the wind as our directional guide. That sensation of not being able to see anything but grey skies and waves, with nothing to grasp onto, was the toughest part. We did see another helicopter before nightfall when the weather started clearing a bit, but it was way too far away from us. Nightfall is also when we can tell that we actually made progress and were getting closer to the island, but the darkness changes all that, as all we could look at were a handful of lights on the island and a bright spot that it was probably a resort, seven or so miles to the north. Fast forward to maybe two or three a.m., some 15 to 16 hours after the boat sank, and we actually get to the island. Of course, it's mostly cliffs. The water is colder, so we swim south until we can see water that isn't white. We get out of the water maybe an hour later and can barely walk. There are some lights in the distance, but no way we were going to get to them in our condition, so we just try to stay warm under some trees out of the rain. No sleep just shivering and trying to stay warm. Finally, the sun comes up and we're able to stop shivering. We can walk somewhat better now, so we start drinking from a nearby stream, assuming we'll be able to get help before we die from some parasite, and start hiking over the hills. I tossed my life vest into a tree just in case someone spots it. The hike takes us a few hours over two ridges and through some pretty thick brush, Fortunately, there were a few more streams. We finally get to a makeshift farm of sorts and decide to eat some bananas from a small banana grove. That's when we spot a guy walking to work on the farm. He feeds us some crackers and water and walks up the road to call the police for us. Based on where we got to land, they changed their search and found the captain and first mate in the water shortly thereafter. We all end up in hospital around the same time and we finally got to escape the hospital after 36 hours and several bags of IV fluids. There's a lot more that happened in that whole 72 hour period, but you get the idea. Funny thing, we went back about 8 months later and tried to get a boat to take us out to where we got to land, but they said it was too dangerous. It was all over the news for like 2.6 minutes, like everything these days. Even though we all survived, I still have PTS from that event, which sucks. It's pretty well triggered when I'm on the water and it's stormy, or in planes and it's turbulent, but PTSD be damned. I'm planning on buying a sailboat by the end of the year and sailing around the Caribbean and Central America, and if I can't get enough blue water experience, maybe across the Pacific, we'll see. I was 29. I was having chest pains. They were reminiscent of when I was younger. I rushed to the hospital just for it to be heartburn. I started treatment for that, but it got to a point where I couldn't move. I was sent home from work and went to my doctor. I described everything and said it just felt like bad heartburn. The doctor starts looking at stuff and treating me for GERDs. Just as she's about to send me on my way, she says she wants to do an EKG. After the results, she brought in a more experienced doctor, who agreed with her and said that they want to keep me overnight for observation. I get to the hospital and they hook me up with a ton of devices. There are multiple tests and they start medicating me. All they told me before I fell asleep from the meds was I had an enlarged and weakened left ventricle. It's now maybe 3 a.m., I'm awoken to the creepiest looking doctor ever. He had this skeleton thin body, but with a round pot belly. Think Farnsworth from Futurama. He was bald, but with this greasy stringy hair that was like long, and he draped a few over his head. 
Meanwhile, I'm still drugged out and afraid of what's going on. He pulls up a chair and asks if I know what's going on. He says I had a nibble of a heart attack, using his pointer finger and thumb to indicate very small. He explains something about numbers, and if they hit a certain number, it indicates a heart attack, and mine hit the number directly next to it. So let's say 10 means a heart attack. I hit a 9. Bear in mind, my dad died of a heart attack when he was 39. I'm laying there freaked out. Everyone I know is asleep, so I have no one to talk to. I'm too drugged out to do anything. I just pushed the button for more drugs to go back to sleep. They did a heart catheter and said my arteries were clean. Months later, I found I had a flu-like virus that went untreated. It reached my heart before my body fought it off. I'd gone to a MedExpress place a month before because I was sick with flu-like symptoms, but they lasted two weeks. The doctor said, it's the flu. You're young, you'll get over it and he never did any tests. I had to wear a heart defibrillator for about four months after that, and I'm on heart medication for the rest of my life. All because the express doc was too lazy to test anything. But that night shift doctor looked like death, and I thought he was coming to tell me that I died. I'm not and have never been a security guard, but I remember one time, I was closing the store with my boss. We locked the front door as we closed and cleaned. This was late at night. Well, near the end of our shift, we heard scratching at our store's front door. It's a glass door, an automatic slider, but as I said, it was locked. We originally shrugged it off as an animal or tweaker. That was until we finished cleaning. My manager heard scratching at the back door, but it can't be opened from the outside. Someone or something was trying to get in. The scratching was violent and near the lower part of the door. My boss was back there, finishing up the inventory check as it happened. He shouted at whoever it was, basically said to leave or were calling the cops. The scratching stopped right after that and he made sure the door was locked from the inside too by procedure. Well, he also opened the door to look around. He saw no one or anything, but there were claw marks where the scratching was. Animals are not uncommon in the area, but it's stray dogs and cats and such, normal stuff. These claws were not normal, not our normal at least. My boss came up to the front where I was putting cleaning stuff away, I was at our main checkout area next to the front door. I asked what happened. He told me. We heard a loud scratching sound at the front door again, but we both turned pale as we saw a human-like hand with claws at the front door and we saw two eyes that were reflective. I was young and actually quite strong. My manager is a shorter and smaller guy. He's also older. He called the police and we didn't leave until the police were at our door. The officer escorted us to our rides and as we left, he followed us. Even the cops saw this. As we pulled out of the driveway in a line, we saw a human-like head peeking at us from the bottom of the building's corner. We all pulled out and stopped at a nearby gas station. The cop confirmed what we saw and he had some other cops drive by, then they looked around. Despite what we saw and what cameras saw, we still don't know what it was. The officer was pretty sure it was a prank, because he went around the area and asked anyone with cameras facing our store. He asked for footage and saw nothing on it. It didn't happen again. As I was unpacking for a solo camping quail hunt, two guys walked into my camp to chat. Dirty and very disheveled, 
obviously drunk. They asked me if you got bullets for that gun when they saw my shotgun case. After a few minutes, they turned to walk back to their camp. I saw that one of them had his scalp peeled back, leaving an open and crusty wound the size of my palm. That night, they drank and threw twenty twos into the fire and ran. Eventually, they passed out. The next day, they were arrested, and I was told that the one with the scalp wound tried to attack someone with a roofing axe a couple of days earlier, and he got the Uno reverse card played, and they were up there, hiding out. So one night, some friends and I were playing hide-and-seek in our hometown. We were probably like 13 at the time. I went into a small area that's basically like a shortcut from the main road to the side road. I unfortunately went alone, and I didn't even think of what could happen. Remember, we were only 13 at the time, and we didn't bring phones with us, so if something happened to us, nobody would even know. So the game started and I ran, sprinting through the wooded area. The first 30 seconds were good. Disclaimer, we have a rule that we have to come to the checkpoint where we start, and we have to save ourselves from not getting picked to search. After around one minute, I start hearing footsteps. I say, Hello, are you one of my friends? And whoever or whatever it was didn't make a sound, so I started backing out. Fortunately, the wooded area has a main route and two side ones, so I could have run either way. I start backing out, and from nowhere, the man just appears from the woods and starts sprinting at me while saying, I'm gonna catch you, in a creepy and eerie way, like a kidnapper. Fortunately, I train in soccer, so I knew I could definitely outrun him, or at least make a good try. I sprint all the way through the wooded area, with the only light being the moonlight, and after about two minutes, he gave up. I continued sprinting and got myself all the way to the checkpoint. I told all of my friends what had just happened. Of course no one believed, but I didn't care since I knew it was real. To this day, I still don't know who or what had tried to catch me that night. But what I do know for sure, if I wasn't a sports guy, the outcome would be very, very different. I used to work at a hospital that was mainly used for mental health. It had fully secured floors and it was our job to control combative patients. Many patients were waiting for felony trials, so lots of stories. The worst one was we did a welfare check on a vehicle in our ER parking lot. They had been sitting there for around an hour or so. The guy inside the car wasn't responding to our attempts to get his attention. We opened up his car door, and he was trying to dig his own foot off with a flathead screwdriver. He'd gotten all the way down to the ankle bones on the one side. We had to wrestle him into the ER as he was on a ton of meth. Seeing the ankle like that and the guy's almost feral-like state felt like something out of a zombie movie. Two stories come to mind both while hiking through the PCT. In Washington, my hiking partner and I did roughly 30 minutes of hiking at dusk. Going down switchbacks, we encountered a mountain lion standing 10 feet away from us. At this point, we were two miles from camp. We did what we had to do to try to scare it off, but we had a standoff with it for about 20 minutes. It definitely wasn't stalking us. It was curious as to why we scared off its dinner. I held onto my friend's backpack while she hiked forward, and I walked backwards to make sure it wasn't following us. It took us about two hours to go two more miles. 
The second story was in Oregon, not too far past Crater Lake. We were camped not too far from a trailhead in the middle of nowhere. Around 2 a.m., a few pickup trucks pulled up, and the people in them started yelling and screaming random stuff. They blindly started shooting into the woods. Thankfully, I don't think in our direction. This is a bit different than other stories, but it gave me chills. My mom's best friend owns a farm about half an hour from where I grew up. We went there nearly every weekend to help with upkeep and caring for our horses. All day you could just feel a storm brewing. The wind, humidity. Outside had a greenish tint and the clouds rolling in as the sun was setting. Right after supper, it started raining hard. A lot of wind and lightning too. I was looking out of the window across the yard and I thought I saw something above the barn on the far side of the yard. I was petrified. It looked like rotation in the clouds and it started lowering down. I pointed it out to my dad. He said it was rain bouncing off the roof of the barn. We both looked out for a moment and clearly saw it suck back up into the clouds. I got goosebumps. We looked at each other for a second in disbelief, then he shrugged and went back into the living room. I sheltered in the bathroom. The next day, we saw in the news that an F4 tornado ripped through a small town, about 24 miles from where we were. I got chills when I saw the news reports. I was about five or six years of age when my grandmother had a party in the local pub in town opposite the local bus station. When the party ended, we went to the bus station. It was my mom, her sister, and I. I was a weird old man already at the station. He looked very creepy. I remember vividly his face and facial expressions and the dirty brown coat that he was wearing and his disgusting smile. First, he seemed like a normal old man making conversation, although creepy looking, but he started trying to touch my mom and grabbing me. I remember running around and hiding behind my mom's legs to stop him from touching me or grabbing me. We got on the bus, shaken up, and we sat on the back of the bus, and for whatever reason, the man didn't get on our bus. I'm not sure if he was full or just decided not to. He got on the next bus that came along, and the two buses were driving in a convoy the whole route. This man just stood at the front by the bus driver, staring into our souls. We got off the bus, and my auntie ran with me in her arms all the way back home, with my mom closely following. I'm not sure if he got off his bus or what happened after. I have questioned and questioned my auntie and my mother because I thought I imagined it. I often wonder what his intentions were, if he just wanted to scare us, or if he had a more sinister plan, but I guess we'll never know. When I was little, I was playing by the dumpster at my apartment complex, and a dog ran up and I swore, with all that was within me, this dog said, Hi Grace. So I took this stray dog home, immediately exclaiming that I was Dr. Doolittle. The very next morning, our complex was full of police, because a little girl had been abducted the night before from the playground dumpster area, and was now missing. I think they found her bike and shoes in that same dumpster. Another story was on Halloween, I was driving to go to the movies, on speakerphone with my friend, and a massive car accident happened all around me. A drunk driver had a head-on collision and tried to flee the scene. I felt other cars hit my car, but I'd covered my face, screaming. Well, my car didn't have a scratch, not a dent. 
My car was covered in broken glass. It even came through the windows. I was just sitting there, boxed in by four cars, in a fatality and other severely injured accident, with EMS looking at me like I was a miracle. But I'd been so bounced around, I couldn't figure out how nothing hit my car. My neck and chest were slightly red from the seatbelt. I sat there for hours in the scene, because the other cars were totaled, and there had been an ejection. But my CD player that had never worked started working all of a sudden, playing in a loop, Go Your Own Way, by Fleetwood Mac. I ended up having to get a new radio, as it would never play anything other than that song. I still have the CD. I'm 27, and I'm a big guy with a sedentary lifestyle. I went to a beach with my family the other day. My uncle and cousin asked if I wanted to snorkel with them. My overly confident self said yes, and I borrowed my cousin's snorkel gear while wearing jean shorts. I went swimming for about 15 minutes or so. Then they suggested to lose our life vests so that we could go deeper. I said yes without understanding that you need proper training to do this, and they've done it since they were children, not me. We proceeded without it, and all of a sudden, I found myself not being able to keep up. I tried swimming faster, but suddenly the water got into my snorkel. Fuck. I went up as fast as I could. I took the snorkel off, and a wave hit me. We were about 70 meters away from the beach. The water was about 6 meters deep. I panicked. I tried yelling, but more waves hit my face. My uncle and cousin couldn't hear me because they were ahead. I turned back and swam like there was no tomorrow to the beach. More waves hit me, and all of a sudden, with its impeccable timing, cramps. Both of my calves are seizing. I don't know if it was adrenaline or luck, but I managed to swim 50 meters to safety while having cramps in both legs. My uncle and cousin came back shortly after realizing I was gone. I went on playing with sand for the rest of the day to calm my nerves. So please, everyone, if you're going into the sea, have at least basic training and gear with you. Don't fuck around. This happened in the Bikerneku Forest, Riga, Latvia. It happened a while ago, back in late June or early August, 2022, at around 9 o'clock at night. It could have been earlier, but it was around that time. A friend and I decided to take photos in the forest. Everything was fine. Of course it was slightly scary, because, well, we're two girls in a forest and it's twilight. At around 9.40, my friend's mom calls her, saying we should go back to her place because it's getting late. Understandable. We will go to her place. I ask my friend if we can take the shortcut out of the forest. My friend agrees, which was our biggest mistake. While going through the shortcut, I see a guy in front of us. He was holding an axe in one of his hands, and he was wearing a horse mask. He was about 195 centimeters tall. He was slowly coming towards us. I take my friend's hand because I'm thinking we're about to die, and I tell her, do not go that way. There's a guy wearing a horse mask. She ignores me and continues walking towards him slowly. With no emotion, I just take her hand and force her to run the longer route. While running, I'm not hearing anything she's saying to me because I'm in a panic. I then see a woman walking with two average-sized dogs. I know I'm dumb for not warning her about the horse guy. We finally escaped the forest, and we're going to my friend's place. While walking to her place, she's asking me a bunch of questions, like what was that, and other stuff. She also mentions hearing that a guy was running after us. So yeah, 
We get to her place and talk about what happened. To be honest, I wish that was the end of it. In October of 2022, I'm casually browsing Latvian news and see some articles about a dead person in the same forest that my friend and I were in. Did we escape a murderer? This happened before Christmas when I was 26, and it sticks with me to this day. I've thought about sharing this many times, but I was never sure if it was scary enough. I guess you decide. My husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, and I decided to meet for dinner at a Christmas market here in Switzerland. He would pick up our dog from doggy daycare, and I would get there after work. Some things that are good to know. At that point, we'd had our dog for about a year. He's called Bean, he's a medium-sized dog, and before he came to Switzerland, he was a street dog in Italy. He was about two and a half years old at that time, and he loved, and still loves, to get all the attention he can get. Also, Christmas markets are incredibly busy here, especially after work. People will meet there with friends to eat dinner and drink mulled wine. When we got to this Christmas market, we realized that it was way too busy to walk through with a dog, and I sent my boyfriend off to get my favorite street food, Malawak. I waited at the edge of the market with Bean. Bean likes to greet everyone who looks at him, and by that point, I'd gotten used to talking with strangers because my dog wanted to meet them, so I wasn't too concerned at first when a guy came up to me. Full transparency, I don't remember word for word what was said, I'm not even sure what language this happened in. I do remember that Bean happily greeted this guy, trying to stand up against him and licking his hands. The guy asked for his name and what breed he is. I told him that Bean is a pincer mix. That's when the situation started to turn. The man insisted that he must be a Basenji. How could I say he's a pincer? All of a sudden, he switched. There's no better word to explain it. He grabbed Bean's leash and said, I'll go now and just try to walk off with my dog. Thankfully, I had a firm grip on his leash. I was incredibly confused and flustered and just stammered out that he can't take my dog. He got increasingly more angry with every second that I didn't let go of the leash. I loudly told him to leave me alone and Bean started to bark at the man. I've never seen Bean this angry and scared at the same time, and thankfully, the man let go of the leash and slipped into the crowd. I was left standing there, a dumbfounded mess with a mess of a dog. Bean was barking and shaking, so I knelt down to calm him down, holding him and talking to him. My boyfriend was still somewhere in the crowd, waiting for our food. After a while, a woman walked up to me and told me not to put my heel to the floor, as she had just seen someone put a poppet there. Now I don't know what is worse. Was it the same guy that tried to steal Bean? Or was it someone else who saw a distressed dog and thought, well, let's scare that dog a bit more? I think the worst thing for me was that apart from that woman who warned me, no one helped me when I was harassed by a weird guy, even though I loudly told him to go away and there were other people standing very close just watching. Bean was the one who scared off the guy in the end. Thankfully, the events of that evening had no lasting impact on Bean. He still loves to greet strangers. I still remember it, and I don't think I will ever forget it. About 12 years ago, while on a 10-day hunting trip in northern Michigan, we were at a place called Dead Stream Swamp. We used to tent it back in these days, and it was about the third week of November, so it was cold, and there was about 6 to 10 inches of snow on the ground. It was time to call it a night. We got in our mummy bags on our cots and had a small battery-operated radio we would listen to while falling asleep. 
the Michigan backwoods get dark as fuck. I mean pitch black and eerie. I passed right out this night, but got woken up sometime later by my hunting buddy Dave saying my name repeatedly. I was sleeping so good, I literally remember thinking it was the radio playing. Then I took notice to my name, and Dave sounded terrified. I said, what? Dude, get your fucking gun. Get your fucking gun, Dave says. I'm disoriented, but I remember saying, why? What's wrong? He then said, dude, someone's here. Now let me add, we were backwoods campers, we didn't stay at state parks or campgrounds, and we were a good 40 minute drive back in the thick Michigan Huron National Forest from any roads or civilization. We had set up our camp at the end of a very long dead end two track. We had been there for five or six days at this point and never saw another person or even sign of someone else being out there. So I'm all like, what the fuck? And in my disbelief haze, I mumbled something like, What do you mean there's someone here? Did you order a fucking pizza? Dave says, Dude, listen. Finally, I came to enough to realize the radio was off. But I could hear ACDC blaring through the forest and a faint sound of an old pickup truck blazing up the two-track towards our camp. I have a big 19-foot tent with a huge rubber tarp draped over it so it was hard to tell there was a tent there if you didn't know there was. At this time, I realized this is wrong, and no one should be driving to our camp in the middle of the night, so I'm reaching for my weapon. Now the headlights were moving across the tent while the truck made its way through the winding two-track, and it was within a hundred yards of our tent. I finally heard yelling over the ACDC, which sounded like an old drunk hillbilly screaming with a screechy-like voice, saying something about, Hey, you fucking neighbors, get your asses out here. At this point, he literally had his truck about a foot away from the door of my tent and was revving his engine up. It blew my mind if this guy found us or even knew we were there. This was really odd. In all my fear, I racked a shell into my Winchester 20 gauge and screamed, You better get the fuck out of here. I'm not playing around. The engine revved up louder, and his truck inched closer to the tent. I thought for sure he was going to run over us. I yelled as loud as I could, I'm not playing. I'm about to start shooting. He must have got the message because he backed his truck up and left, but very very slowly. The rest of the trip had a very odd feeling, and we never figured out who he was or where he came from. Way out by the dirt road where we had turned off of to get back here, there were two or three mobile home trailers that reminded me of the movie The Hills Have Eyes. Just very dirty, lots of odd things hanging on the porches and junk everywhere in the front yards like old fridges, junk cars, and trash. I'm assuming the guy lived in one of them, but we never found out. It still gives me the creeps thinking about it. I thought I was going to have to shoot him in fear of our lives. It was frightening, to say the least. In 2014, I moved to England from Canada to gain work and travel experience, and also to find myself. I ended up living in Essex with three other roommates. They were all women, all a bit older than I was. I was 24 at the time, Megan was 31, Cherry was 34, and Cassie was 38. Megan was from New York, Cherry from New Jersey and Cassie from Poland. All four of us shared this three-story flat. The back of our home was the living room and kitchen. The back wall was complete glass that looked out into the garden. The garden was completely fenced in. The house had an interesting dynamic, to say the least. Tons of stories from that time in my life. I adored all my roommates, except for Cherry. 
After living with Cherry for seven months, I was over her antics. One day I come home from work. I lock the door, make myself something to eat, and go up to bed. I brought some work home with me, so I'm in my nightie with all these papers around me and my headphones on jamming out. I had headphones on because Cherry was out to dinner with work friends. That meant booze, and then soon after, a tantrum was surely to come. I just didn't want to have to listen to her crazy scream crying. I'm working away, completely focused, until I feel something. I look up to see a man standing over me. I don't register it right away and passively say, Cherry's room is on the second floor, and continue to work. Cherry regularly brought strange men home. He doesn't leave. Again, Cherry's room is downstairs, you. He then interrupts. I'm not here for Cherry. A cold chill iced my veins. My fight or flight kicked in just then. I started surveying the situation. I look him up and down. He has a bottle of Prosecco in one hand and a knife in the other. He's about five foot ten, wild muddy brown hair and black eyes. He has a light blue polo shirt on and one side of his collar is popped up and he had a distinct Manchester accent. Once I focused in, I realized his eyes were black because his pupils were completely dilated. Shit, I was in trouble. I needed an escape plan. Unfortunately, this man was standing between me and my bedroom door. I needed to get downstairs, but I needed for him to think it was his idea. I decided to play along. Just then, he uses his knife to pop the cork. Prosecco started flowing onto my carpet. I said, oh no, let's clean that up. I prefer to drink out of a proper flute anyway. He nodded, replying, yeah, you're a proper classy bird. Let's go. I try to act as natural as possible. I try not to show that I'm shaking all over and try to gain control over my breathing. We take the long journey down to the main floor of my flat all three floors. He has the back of my nighty bunched up in one hand and I could feel the point of the knife graze my back with his other. I was trying to playfully speak with him as we walked down the stairs. I couldn't tell you what I was saying. I was most likely rambling. I couldn't hear anything over my heart beating in my ears. We get to the bottom of the stairs and there's a hallway to my left that leads to the front door. On my right, which is much closer to us, is the kitchen and living room. We make our way into the kitchen. I point to the cabinets that had the wine glasses. He said he knew where they were and starts towards them. I now had the kitchen table in between us. It was time to run. I burst into a sprint down the hallway towards the door. My hands fumble over the locks, shaking and sweating. I swing open the door and see two men walking across the street. They must have been walking home from the train. There was a big train station in front of our home. I call out to them for help, and suddenly I'm flung onto the ground. Little pebbles piercing my skin sent sharp pains where they jabbed. The intruder pushed me out of the way to run and escape. One of the men chased after the intruder, while the other said for me to go inside while he surveyed my home and to call the police. I locked the doors and I called the police. While I'm on the phone with dispatch, I maniacally run around the house to double check all the windows and doors. Suddenly, I hear a loud bang on my door. I inform the dispatch of the banging and she informs me that the police weren't there yet. I thought it might be one of the gentlemen who helped me. I go to look out the eye hole and it's him. The intruder. He came back. He's banging on my door, screaming that I had his glasses and that he was not done with me. I absolutely freak out. The dispatcher attempts to calm me down, but I'm losing my ever-loving mind. She then said, They're pulling onto your street now. You should hear the sirens. 
I did, thank God. The intruder then blasts off. One officer jumps out of the passenger side while the car is still moving and chases after him. The second officer comes into my home, interviews me and the two gentlemen, collects evidence, takes photos. After some time of him being there, Cherry comes home and freaks out. Once the situation was explained to her, she said, Oh my god, that could have been me. Yeah, thanks Cherry, it's all about you. The next morning, I'm called in to identify a man they had in custody. I pointed him out. I go into a little room and the officer pulls out an evidence bag. He asked me if the items were mine. They were. There were my underwear and photos taken from my home. The officer informed me that the intruder had been stalking me for some time now. He estimates three months. He had made a nest outside of our home on top of a hill that overlooked into our living room and kitchen. He is a known sex offender and drug dealer. The officer then told me how lucky I was to get out practically unharmed. Others weren't so lucky. To the man who stopped me and broke into my home, let's not meet again. However, I would love to run into those two gentlemen again. Every day, I am thankful for them. We were on holiday in the south of France on the Atlantic coast near Arcachon. Across from our campsite, there was this huge forest, and one day we decided to drive into it because it had paved roads. We figured it'd be full of hikers, cyclists, holiday homes, and so on, because this was a major tourist hotspot. But there was nothing, nobody for miles. It was eerily quiet as well. No birds, no animals. What it did have, though, was a collection of seemingly random signs shaped like arrows with numbers on them. At random points, we saw pipes sticking out of the ground, and every now and then, we'd run into an unlocked parking lot with jack pumps in them. Now, I'm not superstitious, but my neck hair was standing up. I asked my significant other to turn back to the campsite, and so he turned on the GPS. Okay. No problem, except our global positioning system failed to globally position us. It didn't recognize the roads we were on, and those roads were getting increasingly dingy, but because we'd been driving for a while, we had no idea in which direction to turn. So my significant other kept on driving, hoping we'd eventually find the way back. All the while, I kept getting this very primal feeling that this was wrong that we weren't supposed to be here, that there was something in the forest didn't want us there. Or maybe it did, but not for good. After a while, when the roads were getting really dodgy, full of potholes and with weeds coming through, the GPS suddenly sprang back to life, and it told us we were only a couple hundred meters away from the campsite. Okay, seems weird, but my significant other followed the directions, the road we were on turned into a dirt road covered in holes and for some reason, pottery shards. I kept asking my significant other to turn around, but he refused to and kept pointing to the GPS. At that point, the entrance to the campsite was supposed to be only about 50 yards away, yet all I could see was trees and everything was still eerily quiet. No sounds of kids playing in the pool people talking, cars driving by, nothing. And in the back of my mind, it was still telling me to leave. Now, get out. I'd had enough. I told my significant other to turn the car around now, or I'd get out and walk out of the damn forest. He looked at me like I was nuts, but he listened. He turned the car around and nearly got stuck in the bushes because by now, the road was little more than a trail. Miraculously, once we turned back, 
our GPS sprang to life once again. It sent us in the opposite direction immediately, and we drove out of the forest in minutes, when before, all we'd been able to do was drive in circles. I'm not one who believes in ghosts, but I figured the GPS wouldn't randomly make up a position. So the next day, I crossed the road across the campsite and went back into the forest to see if I could find the road we'd been on, since it was supposed to be only 50 yards from the campsite gates. I looked for over an hour. I could not find the weird trail we'd been on with the pottery shards. It mostly stuck with me because I'm a fairly rational person, or so I'd like to think, and I've never experienced that feeling that I needed to get out right now, or something bad would befall me. It was decidedly creepy. I'd be tempted to go back just to see if I'd get the same feeling. If our new and improved GPS would be more ghost-proof, but unfortunately, the entire forest burned down to the ground a few years back. Many years ago, I used to work night shift at a hotel in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. During the season, it wasn't so bad, mostly families and stuff. We had on-site security then too, however, in the off-season, the winter months were different. The cheap weekly rates we'd offer attracted a lot of creepy people. The idea was supposed to be to make money in the off-season by renting to what is known as snowbirds, older retired people who came to the beach for a month or more through the winter. It did not always work out that way though. The cheap rates made it possible for a less than desirable element to become long-term residents. I have discovered more than my fair share of meth labs, broken up physical assaults, and more during the winter months. Working third shift, I would meet some interesting people. The cold weather would mean some homeless people would come in and get warm and grab a cup of free coffee. I wasn't supposed to let them, but it's not in me to be cruel. I would let them grab a coffee and get warm for a minute, as long as they didn't cause trouble. As you can see, night shift in the winter made for some crazy and sometimes creepy stories. I have a lot, but this one is one that stands out, because it didn't end well for me. I had a great night up until this point. I'd gone to an indie wrestling show with my best friend before work. In fact, I had agreed to come in an hour early the next night for the young lady that worked second shift in exchange for her working an hour late for me on this night so I could enjoy the wrestling show. Ironically enough, I met Terry Funk that night, a wrestling legend known for his hardcore and bloody matches. Little did I know I was about to experience this kind of violence for real. I was supposed to be there at midnight due to her working over an hour for me. I normally came in at 11pm. I counted the register and she briefed me on her shift as to what had happened as per usual. As she was leaving, my friend Andrew pulled up. He worked second shift maintenance at this hotel and the other two hotels are company owned. He would regularly stop by after work and grab us some food and we would play World of Warcraft on our laptops after eating for a while due to business being slow. He was just getting my money and order for food and getting ready to leave. I was excited, telling him about how much fun I had at the wrestling show and was showing him my Terry Funk shirt that I was so proud of. I was just walking into the back office to put the shirt up when I heard the doorbell indicating a customer had entered. It is true what they say, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I turned around when I heard someone say something loudly, but I couldn't make out what they had said. I had just reached the doorway when I saw Andrew just fall down in front of me. The next thing I know, a guy walks around the corner and punches me in the head with a short steel pipe in his hand. It staggered me and I went to one knee. The next thing I know, he hits me in the head with a pipe. After that, I hear another guy who I hadn't noticed to this moment saying that he got away and got a cop. They left out the door. I was finally able to get to my feet. I tried to call the police from the phone in the back office, but it was having issues. 
I slammed it in frustration. I was hurting and scared. I was really freaking out. I realized that they could come back, so I ran and locked the door. I didn't know where Andrew had gone, and that worried me. I called 911 about this time. Blood had started pouring down my head. I told the operator I'd been attacked and needed an officer and ambulance. I then called the other hotel we ran to let the night manager, Travis, who was over all three properties, know what happened. He thought I was messing with him at first, because when we got bored, we would prank each other. I finally convinced him I was not joking. He was going to lock up and come down. The police and ambulance pulled up and I opened the door. It was at this point that I found out that after they'd sucker punched Andrew and knocked him down, he was amazingly able to jump over the desk and escape, just as a cop was driving by, which he managed to flag down for help. I ended up in the hospital ER where I had to have 10 staples in my scalp, and they gave me morphine for the pain. I had no way to get home after being treated, but the doctor and nurses took pity on me and paid for a cab. My plan was to go back to work because this was December and Christmas was coming. I had three kids and needed all the hours I could get. When I got back to the hotel, the IT guy Ted was there with his wife, Barbara, who also worked the front desk. She was shocked to see me. She thought I would still be in the hospital. I thought I'd only been hit in the head once after being punched, but the video which Ted was pulling for the police showed a different story. After I went to one knee, the guy had hit me not just once, but ten times in total. I kept trying to grab the pipe and get up for some reason. I don't remember that. I guess I was out on my feet. He kept punching me and hitting me with the pipe, until his friend tells him Andrew had gotten away and then proceeded to get the cops. The two of them then ran out. I was given a room at the other hotel we own, and Ted and Barbara gave me a lift there as I was in no condition to drive due to the morphine. They also gave me a paid week off to heal. They switched me over to the other hotel on night shift for a month, just in case they were after me in particular. We never found out why they chose to attack me. The police thought it might be a failed strong-armed robbery, due to Andrew getting away and me just not going down. It shook me up though, not knowing. Even though I was at our other hotel when I came back to working night shift, I was still nervous. Every time the door chimed, I tensed up. I couldn't afford to quit though. As I said, I had three kids I was supporting. They never caught the guys as far as I know. A detective stopped by about two months later when I was working second. He showed me several mugshots and asked me if any of them looked familiar. I never got a great look at them as it all happened so fast. I had seen the video, which wasn't the best quality. Even so, two of them looked very familiar like them. I pointed them out and he asked how sure I was. I told him honestly, like 85%. He then yelled and asked me if I wanted someone to go to jail for attempted murder on 85%. I was stunned into silence. I was the victim. I was attacked for no reason and he's yelling at me like it's my fault. I was busy being attacked to get a good look at them. I no longer work at a hotel and I don't do night shifts and I'm glad because it's just too dangerous in this area. Last week I received a call from an unknown caller. My first thought was that someone wants to sell me anything or something like that. Normally I wouldn't answer, but I was bored and thought I might prank the other person. A male voice that didn't sound familiar to me said, You proved that you're a real fighter. You didn't let life defeat you. I will call you again in a week, and then it will start. I thought nothing about it, and I assumed it was a harmless joke. Until yesterday, when a week passed by. I was on my way to a job interview and was waiting at a bus stop for the bus, which was already in sight, but stood in front of a red traffic light. My phone started to ring, and again it's from an unknown caller. This time I didn't want to answer, but all of a sudden this guy who was sitting at the bus stop said, didn't he mention he would call you again? At first I thought he was on the phone because he had airpods inside of his ears. 
But then he looked straight in my direction and asked, Don't you want to answer? I asked him what he means, but he didn't answer me. Then my bus arrived. I was in a hurry, so I just got on and left. I did my job interview and went home, and I haven't left my apartment since. Sometimes I look out of the windows to see if anything or anyone seems strange to me, but so far I haven't noticed anything. There have been no further calls. I'm a bit scared now, and I don't know what I should do about it. What do you think about all of this? Where I work, there's a closed, old, locked psych unit on the 11th floor. It's occasionally used for overflow patients and staffed by float pool when needed. Working night shift, I had a patient ask during night med pass if I could ask housekeeping to not empty her trash can in the middle of the night, as it woke her up the night before. I thought, weird, but okay. I called housekeeping and they said they don't have anyone cleaning on nights on the overflow unit. This patient was fully oriented, walkie-talkie, not weird at all, not a sundowner in any way whatsoever. 3 a.m. rolls around, and the patient rings her call bell, and as I'm walking down the hall to her room, the double doors that's locked and requires a badge swipe closes. I answered her bell, and she's mad because she asked for housekeeping not to come in, and they did. She said they emptied her trash, and she heard the can open and the trash bag rustle. I profusely apologize and insist it won't happen again. I call housekeeping again, who stated they don't have someone covering our floor at night because it's just an overflow unit. So I call security since the doors are badge access only, they pulled up the badge swipe locks for the doors, and no one had accessed the doors after the kitchen staff picked up the dirty trays at 9pm. They pulled footage of the whole corridor, and can clearly see the doors open halfway, close, and not a single person in sight. We still have no explanation to this day, and it's just well known that the 11th floor is haunted. Apparently it was making the psych patients go crazier, and they moved the unit to a new wing of the hospital, and now only use this floor for short-term overflow. This happened around 2021 in India, around the pandemic period where lockdowns were still very much in effect. My dad used to live in another city, my brother was in college, and my mom had a government job, so she had to go to her office every day. So I was basically left alone from 10am to around 6pm. We used to live in an apartment unit, but it had two doors. One was the main door, and the other one was located in the biggest bedroom, basically my parents' room. The door was clearly locked with an actual lock from the outside, and it also had a metal sliding door, the kind with the change structure. I'm from India, so you can Google elevators to find out what I'm talking about. And it was also locked from the outside. We had a ring bell on the outside, but it was just connected to a small bulb in the bedroom. So one day, around 12 p.m., I was in my room, which was basically adjacent to my parents' room, and I felt weird, so I just went to check their room. I went to the room to see the bulb blinking. That meant that someone was ringing the doorbell. My mom used to say ignore it because if it was someone we knew ringing it, they would know the real door. I stood there for a moment when the person started knocking really hard on the door. It was straight up rattling. But the thing was, due to the metal gate in front of it, it would be very hard to put your hand inside to knock at the actual door. Even I couldn't put more than half of my palm through. I was a teen back then, so I wasn't that big, and this man was straight up banging on it. I got scared and called my mom. She told me not to panic, but I was really weirded out. So I locked my parents' door with the lock they had, and I went downstairs to chill in my brother's room. 
It was one of those days where my mom wouldn't be home until like 8pm, so I was alone for a long time. I was too scared to go upstairs. At around 6pm, our helper auntie came and I was a little better that someone else was in the house. And during that time, I used to take private tuition and my teacher used to come around at 7.30pm. I felt a bit better knowing that I'd have people around. Our main door had a big window just beside it, so whenever someone was at the door, we used to open the window to check who was there before opening it. But, Auntie had a habit of opening it without checking. Fortunately that day, when the doorbell rang, she opened the window, and then she came to my brother's room to tell me I had a cake delivery. Thing was, I didn't, obviously, so I went to check through the window. There was a man with a cap hiding his face, holding a very small box. Now, a cake box is usually square and big, right? Even a pound cake has a big-ass box. And in India, we have a very small sweet box. So imagine a 100-gram sweet box being called cake box. And I asked him who the delivery was for. He didn't give me any name, not even of the company. He just told me it was for our flat. I called my mom and asked if she had made the delivery, and she didn't know what I was talking about. The guy just wanted me to accept the box and open the door, and just by chance, my teacher walked up the stairs and asked what was happening. The guy saw my teacher and ran up the stairs. I then let my teacher in. Later, when my mom inquired about the delivery guy coming to our flat with our security guard, he said he wasn't there at his post for around half an hour when it happened. The building where we live didn't have CCTV, and no one saw him. I guess it might not be that scary, but it did shake me up, and I asked my mom to at least hurry up from her office the next day, and I stopped staying upstairs whenever... I was home alone. A buddy of mine and I were paddling the Buffalo River in Arkansas. For reasons neither interesting nor relevant, we had to pull off and camp for the night next to a field in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of the night, we were woken up by ATVs not too far away. They got closer and closer until they were at our campsite. They started doing laps around our tent and yelling all kinds of things. It was exactly how you would imagine it to go in a movie, right before the psycho rednecks do terrible things to the protagonists. Also, I'm from a redneck place where this was a completely plausible scenario ending with me and my buddy bleeding out at least a little. So we just laid there and hoped for the best. And fortunately, they quickly got bored and left. This was one night, maybe five or so years ago, my missus wakes me up in the middle of the night. One side of her face is covered in blood, and there's a small pool of wet blood on her pillow about the size of my palm. It's not massive, but it's still quite a bit. I ask her what happened, and she says she doesn't know. She just woke up like that. I get her into some decent lighting, clean her up, and look for the wound. After a good 30 minutes, I can't find anything. Not a scratch, not even a spot that she might have caught in her sleep. There's no blood in or around her nose, eyes, ears, or mouth. Nothing is wrong with her that would cause that much blood. I check the pillow, the bed, the floor. I even look over the walls and ceiling. The only blood I find is this now dry pool about the size of my hand on the pillow. I still have no idea what the hell that was about. It was like the blood came out of nowhere. It must have been fairly soon before she woke me up as well, as it was still quite wet when I first looked, and by the time I'd cleaned her up and checked her, it was dry. 
The only possible explanation I can think of is a bloody gum or tooth, or her nose, but it seemed like way too much blood for that, and there was no blood in or around her mouth or nose. This happened around 10 years ago now. I was around 13 to 14 and pretty small at the time. It was during the winter period, so at the time I was coming home from extra scholar activities, it was already dark at around 6 p.m. I stepped off of the bus and still had a five minute walk. However, the area we were living in wasn't the best and my older brother always told me to hold my keys in my hand, ready to protect myself. Three keys between my fingers, like I'm Wolverine or some shit like that. I saw a guy walking toward me, but he didn't really raise any red flags. It was just a guy walking home. He didn't look at me or speed up when he saw me. Nothing. After he passed me though, he grabbed me by the jacket and threw me on the floor. He was quite a big guy, while I could compare my weight to an oversized chicken. The guy started kicking me and punching me, and after the initial shock, I did the only thing that came into my head. I pulled my keys out of my pocket and stabbed him with all my strength in his thigh. One key went right in. He screamed in pain and fell to the ground. I used this opportunity to get the hell out of there. After two minutes of sprinting, I was home, bleeding from my face and crying. I told my parents everything. We went back to where he grabbed me, but there was only some blood on the floor and no sign of him. We reported the incident to the police and never heard anything back from them. My parents decided to buy me a pocket knife after that, and my older brother got me a better one, which I still have and is pretty cool. I had been living for the past year in a transitional housing apartment provided to me by a state-run program. When I first entered the program, they told me that I'd be allowed to stay in this apartment with my two little girls for two years, and at the end of said two years, they would match any savings that I had, up to 2500 It seemed like a dream come true. Fast forward a year, and the pandemic happens. I'm a barber, so of course, the shop where I worked was shut down, and I was penniless and out of work. Thankfully, I qualified for unemployment, and it was so plentiful after the $600 boost, I fixed up my broken down car, got some much needed dental work done, and started to reclaim my credit. With so much money circulating in my pocket, I decided to invest that money into opening my own shop as soon as the lockdown was over. This way, when it's time to move on from this place, I'll be in a good place to start fresh. So fast forward again about two months after quarantine, and my business is doing well. I'm not really making money, but I'm also not losing a ton of money either. Also, I'm my own boss, which means that I have more time with my kids. At this point, I'm feeling so very blessed, and every day I feel so thankful for my new windfall. One day I get a call from my case manager asking me for my income details. Now, this isn't unheard of in this program, but it is strange because I'm unemployed technically and as far as they know, I don't have any income. So I give them all the information they ask for and about a week later, I get a message from them saying that I no longer qualify for their program because I make too much money on unemployment and that I should have used the extra money to secure stable housing. I try to explain that I couldn't find stable housing because I'm unemployed and that the boost is temporary, but they can't be reasoned with. However, this whole journey so far has been more than I could have ever hoped for, and as much as it saddens me and honestly shocks me, I really can't complain too much. So, I start the hunt for a new apartment. As a barber, I usually chat with my clients all day every day just about random stuff, 
but usually we just end up telling stories about our lives and what's going on in our day-to-day -day life. So I'm talking to my clients, a guy and his wife, about my apartment hunt and how I have to be out within the month. I have horrible credit and I can't pass any income verification because honestly, I have none. My shop isn't making money and I'm basically living on unemployment at the moment. So my clients, who happen to be Serbian, basically tell me that if I have hurdles to overcome, the easiest way to get past them is to look in areas where there are a lot of immigrants because a lot of them are overcoming the same hurdles. So they tell me, don't worry, my apartment search is done. At this point, the month is more than half over and I don't have many options. I'm trusting them, but I'm still looking on my own as well. About a week before the end of the month, my dad calls me and says that he wants me and the girls to move in with him. He lives about an hour from my barber shop and my girl's school, and the commute in the winter will be awful. It's not an ideal situation, but I guess for now, it's the best option that I have, so I start making plans to move in with him. About two days after that, I get a call from my client and his wife telling me that they're moving and that they've talked to their landlord for me. If I want their apartment, then it's mine. Long story short, I'm elated. They live one block away from my current apartment, which is about a block from my kid's school and five minutes from my shop. They tell me that I can come over and check out the apartment. Of course, I drop everything right then and there and head over. The apartment is gorgeous. It has high ceilings, two spacious bedrooms, and even a separate dining room, which is huge as well. It must be at least double the size of my current apartment, and for only $400 extra per month in rent. I'm so happy I could cry. I thank them profusely, and ask them about the landlord and the other tenants. Basically, I'm just making conversation, because obviously I'm taking this apartment. They tell me that the landlord is a sweet old man, and that his daughter can be a bit bitchy, but we rarely ever have to deal with her. The neighbors are all very sweet, and even though the people upstairs can be kind of loud, they aren't bad either. He tells me that the guy across the hall just moved in with his daughter a few months ago, but they pretty much keep to themselves. Then my client and his wife joke about how he tends to have a lot of lady callers, who they assume are hookers because they all seem to be pretty young and scantily clad. We all laugh a bit, and I thank them again and head home to resume packing. Later that night, I get another email from my case manager about how I need to be out of the apartment soon. At this point, I'm so thankful for my clients because I was feeling hopeless and like I was slowly falling into a depression before they gave me this amazing gift. So fast forward another week and it's finally time to secure my lease and get my new keys. The landlord is a little apprehensive once he finds out that I'm a single mom and a new business owner. He thinks that I won't be able to afford the rent, but he basically takes a chance on me. I'm so grateful for the good news, and even though I'm also a little scared and unsure about my new predicament, I'm optimistic as well. Here's where things get weird. So I gave the landlord my deposit and received my keys. The first thing I did was paint my new apartment. After about 12 hours of non-stop painting, not only was I exhausted, I was starving. The only thing was that I was covered in paint and really didn't have the energy to shower, let alone leave my place for food. I didn't have much money at this point, but I figured that I deserved a little job well done splurge, so I ordered Chipotle on Uber Eats. As soon as I put my phone down and really settled in to the quiet of my new apartment, I started feeling weird, just kind of creeped out. Maybe because I was by myself, or maybe because the place was unfamiliar to me, but it was like a strange, hair-raising feeling. So I called my boyfriend to come over. After about 20 long, creepy, hungry minutes, I finally got the call from my Uber delivery guy that my food was here. I could hear something that sounded like sobbing in the background, but I brushed it off and ran to the door to grab the meal. 
As I'm heading to the front door, I notice two things. The apartment door across the hall is wide open, and the sobbing is coming from these two young girls standing at the front door. They look to be about 15 or 16, and they aren't just sobbing, they're wailing. I walk past the wailing teens and grab my food from the guy who looks at me with panic in his eyes, and he takes off quickly. In my head, I register it as odd, but I don't really think twice about it. Instead, I now focus in on the two girls to my right. Hey, you girls okay? I ask hesitantly. One of the girls has a phone in her hand, and I hear the woman on the phone ask who I am. No, my dad is in bed. He's naked. Something about him just doesn't look right. The girl with the phone wails. The other girl grabs her other hand, and they begin sobbing again. I immediately jump into mom mode. I imagine this idiot dad in a drunken passed out state, scaring the hell out of his kids. I hear the person on the phone say that she's going to call the police. I tell her that I'm the across the hall neighbor and that I'm going to check it out. So I head up with the two girls into my apartment to sit my food down and tell them to take me to their dad. At this point, I'm extremely irritated with this guy who I don't even know, because how irresponsible to get that drunk midday knowing your kid could be home any minute. As the girls are leading me through their apartment, I notice that it's pretty much empty. Just one lamp in the living room and one pot on the counter in the kitchen. Weird. They moved in months ago, I thought. I brushed off the thought as I realized the girls have stopped walking. Jeez, they're really scared. I look back at the girl with the phone to reassure her that he's probably fine, and she doesn't come any closer. He, he's naked, she warns, and she hands me a blanket randomly. I didn't even notice that she'd grabbed it. I turn back to the door in front of me, and I ask her if this is where he is. She nods, but doesn't come any closer. Sir, I call out, not wanting to freak him out. Sir... I call out again, a little more cautiously this time. There's no answer, no sound at all, so I slowly push open the door. My eyes immediately flash to the only thing in the room, which is the bed. The room is brightly lit from the sun outside, and I quickly glance away from the obviously naked figure laying spread eagle in the bed. Sir, I repeat trying to be respectful of the fact that I'm in his home, and he's naked, and I'm a stranger. Still nothing. Not a sound. I slowly look back over to the bed. Now I'm examining the full picture. He's definitely naked. Very naked. I'm not wearing my glasses, of course, so I just step a little closer into the room. And as I do... I realize that he's wearing an empty condom and that his chest is raised unnaturally into the air. Also that his head is back in an extremely unnatural angle as well. As my eyes take in even more details, I notice that his fingers are curled and the tips of them are black and that from the top of his chest to his chin is black as well. I stare at his chest for a while to confirm what I was beginning to suspect. He's dead, very dead, and it looks like he wasn't alone when he died. Someone left him like this. I slowly back out of the room and close the door as I leave. The girls are still in the hallway. Is he okay? The girl and the woman on the phone ask simultaneously. I pull the girls with me into my apartment. I tell them that I don't know and ask who the woman on the phone is. She tells me that she's their mother. I ask the girl for her phone, and I tell her to have a seat in my living room while I spoke to her mother in private. Ma'am, where are you? I ask, trying to keep my voice calm. The woman is on FaceTime, and I can see the panic on her face. I'm in Texas. Is he dead? She asks me, with one hand over her mouth. At this point, 
I don't even know how to break the news to her. Ma'am, I don't know for sure, because I'm no trained professional, but he's not moving, and his fingers are black. I respond, trying to be respectful, and also convey the urgency of the situation. Is he dead? She asks again, this time more panicked. I don't know, ma'am. All I know is that he sure doesn't look alive. I reply, and this time a little more forcefully. Her hand flies to her mouth, and she wails, and she hangs up the phone. I walk out of my bedroom into the living room to return the phone to the little girls. Only, they aren't there. I walk back towards their apartment to find them heading back in. No, sweetie, you guys should come sit with me until... I'm cut off by an officer walking into the unit as I'm leading the girls back into the hallway. It's only at this point do I realize how suspicious this could all look. I point the officer into the guy's bedroom. He turns and looks at me and asks who I am. He questions me for a while, but after seeing all the paint on me, he decides that I'm probably not a person of interest and he lets me go back to my apartment. Just then, about four other officers fill the tiny hallway between the units and the girl's uncle shows up. He leads them downstairs to speak with the officers. I go back to my place, and the rest of the day kind of goes by in a blur. Eventually, everything quietens down, and my boyfriend gets there. He comforts me and tells me that there's still a few officers in the hallway. They don't leave completely until well after one in the morning. They also didn't move the body for a while either. It was all so very surreal. My boyfriend kept asking me how I did not hear anything. I keep telling him that I was just so focused on my painting. I just feel horrible for those poor girls. Can you imagine that being the way you last see your dad? I know I can't unsee it. Here we are, a whole week later. We still don't know what happened to him. However, I just keep thinking about my clients telling me about the hookers and strange women. Another thing that I can't get out of my head is that I heard those kids come home. I remember because they flew into the parking lot behind our building, and I remember making a mental note to remind my kids to be careful when walking to the car. I heard them giggling in the hallway between our apartments. The girls got home at least three hours before I found them in the doorway, crying. That means that they were home for at least three hours with their dad in the next room. I still have that weird, creepy, hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck. What a nice welcoming to the new building. Next time, I'll probably just mind my own business. I had a few occurrences that started when I was young and tapered off as I got older. I'll try to list them chronologically. When I was 12, I remember looking at a picture of a girl on my mom's wall. I fell asleep in my bed beside her while she read a book. A short while after I fell asleep, I started to see the face of the girl. As I focused more and more on her face, her eyes came starkly into focus and I heard a loud snapping noise in my head. The next thing I knew, I was paralyzed, awake, and trying to call out for my mom who was right beside me, still reading, and none the wiser to the fact that I was lying beside her, looking at her, and absolutely terrified for my life. This kind of thing started happening to me a lot. When I was 16, the paralysis happened to me in my own bed, but this time it was much stronger than usual and it carried an extra level of terror. It's important to mention a detail about this paralysis. Whenever it happened, it was accompanied by some kind of rhythmic whooshing feeling and sound that would ebb and flow more intensely as I tried to regain control of my body. Fighting to regain control of my body was a habit I developed over years of this occurring to me. Starting with the fingers, then the hands, 
and the rest of my body. On this occasion, as this whooshing happened, a terrible voice went along with the rhythm and said, You will do as I say. It was so sinister, so horrifying. After years of being paralyzed, of growing accustomed to just the horror of being unable to move, to suddenly hear a voice talking to me, I was beyond mortified. I fought for control of my body, finger by finger, hand by hand, arm by arm, all while under the newfound terror of believing something otherworldly and malevolent was trying to take over my body. I finally broke free, ran into my mother's room, waking her up in my panic, and I told her about it. Unfortunately, her response was angry and blaming me for it because of my games and movies or whatever. That's not the support I needed, but it's what I got. On one occasion, I fell asleep on the sofa in our living room. I was 16 at the time. I don't know how much time had passed. I was awoken by sleep paralysis again. This time, I decided I would close my eyes and try to write it out. So, I closed my eyes and seconds later, I started to feel like I was rushing upwards really quickly. Panicked, I opened my eyes again and found myself staring only slightly more than a hand's length from the living room ceiling. I cannot state how absolutely awake I was during this. I can tell you with the most sincerity, I wasn't dreaming. I was awake as I am now and I was inches from the ceiling. I turned around and looked upon my body, still lying there on the sofa, eyes closed, by all appearances, sleeping soundly on the sofa. I should take a moment to mention that, amongst my three older sisters and I, we all had experiences in that house that led us to believe the house wasn't exactly normal. Two rooms stood out the most, both of them with similar ghostly experiences but different enough from each other to make us all believe that there were two different entities in the house. All the standard ghostly stuff would happen in the house, including taps turning on, toilets flushing, being called by someone else and finding out they didn't actually call us, whistling in the halls late at night, that kind of thing. So, here I am, disembodied and, for lack of a better word, hovering in the middle of my living room. At first, I drifted over to the doorway between the living room and the kitchen. I say drifted because it's the closest word I can use to describe what moving was like in this state. Even moving was odd. As I moved, I couldn't feel the movement, which really stood out to me. If I broke it down into the clearest description, it was more like I simply existed in this state and movement consisted of my existence traveling from place to place. When I reached the doorway, I instinctively tried to turn on the light, but even that was weird as I couldn't touch the light switch. I tried to use my hand to turn on the light switch, and it was like I just suddenly had a hand to use because I thought of it, though it couldn't interact with the switch. And when I finished trying, my hand didn't exist anymore. After that experience, I suddenly panicked at the realization of what I was. It finally hit me. I was, for all intents and purposes, a ghost. I was in the same realm as the other things in my house. One thing my sisters and I all agreed on was that whatever was in our basement, particularly in a specific room down there, it wasn't good. In fact, Whatever was down there, it was quite terrifying. I started moving through the kitchen, around the corner and up the stairs. I quickly rounded the corner again, towards my mom's room, and went through the door. As soon as I entered the room, I noticed a woman sitting in the wooden chair facing the door. The woman started talking to me, and I lost consciousness immediately. At least that's the last thing I remember. I didn't think to talk about this with any of my sisters or mother for some time after it happened, but it did come up much later in a conversation 
that took place with my oldest sister. At the time, my oldest sister was dating a man. It so happened that my mother went on a cruise with her mom, so us kids had the house to ourselves. My sister had her boyfriend stay over the night before, and they had slept in my mom's room. While eating cereal, my sister started telling me about something freaky that happened during the night. It seemed she was woken up in the middle of the night by an uneasy feeling. She described looking over at the closet and seeing a woman coming out of the closet with her arms out and a terrifying look on her face. She grabbed the chest of her sleeping boyfriend and he woke. He then said, holy shit, before both of them bolted out of the room. Apparently, his next words were, did you see that woman in the closet? And to her shock and horror, they had both seen the same thing. At this point, I matter-of-factly started asking her questions about the woman, such as, did she have dark, scraggly hair? Was she wearing a white dress? Was she pale with a gaunt face? And such. My sister then asked me how I knew all of this, which is when I told her about my out-of-body experience and the woman I'd seen in my mother's room. It's rather funny to think about now, taking into consideration just how derivative it sounds from plenty of horror movies in the last couple of decades. If it helps make it sound any less derivative, these things occurred over 24 years, so for me at least, these events didn't remind me of any horror movie I'd ever seen. This all felt quite new and terrifying. Here are a few other events that stood out to me. I mentioned the room downstairs had something bad in it. If you were to walk into the room and close the door, it was as if a vacuum seal was created by the closing door. The door didn't close particularly tightly, mind you. It was something else. By closing the door, it became much harder to hear noises outside of the room, and the silence of the room would almost immediately set in. Aside from one particular noise, a steady and unmistakable thump, 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 coming from no particular direction. It sounded like a thumping in the walls, but you couldn't find out which wall it was coming from. Other things that happened in that room, which I'll state below, but I can't really remember the order that they happened in, so please forgive me. On a night, I decided to sleep in that room. I was entirely asleep and remember that I was sleeping on my side, facing the wall, and my cat was sleeping between the wall and myself. There was a whistle in the hallway outside of the room. It was the kind of whistle someone would do to get someone else's attention. As I was fully asleep, the whistle was more so a sound in my dream. It happened again, this time a little closer, still asleep but coming too. Again, closer this time. My eyes are open and I can't move. The whistle happens again, this time right at the door. I can see that my cat has woken up and his head is up and alert. At this point, the door pushed open. I say pushed open because the way the door was mounted, it dragged noticeably on the carpet below. Needless to say, if that door opened, it was pushed open. I was horrified, paralyzed purely by fear, helpless to do anything but look around me, panicking. I remember seeing my cat watching something move from the door to behind me. This happened while I could feel whatever it was move into the room. I felt it behind me, this perceptibly dark and malevolent thing. This presence I was unable to see, but couldn't possibly avoid acknowledging at my back. Its presence filled the whole room with malice, and I just knew, beyond any doubt, that it was focused squarely on me. I couldn't say how much time passed before I lost consciousness, only that I woke up the next morning with full awareness of what had happened during the night. That was the first and last time I slept in that room. On another occasion, a friend of mine and I were hanging out on the basement balcony, smoking and talking. 
It was quite late at night, and I should mention that most of my friends had already heard stories about or experienced weird things in our house. This will be important in a moment. It was quite late at night, and we were hanging out down there for two reasons. I didn't want to wake my mother, and more specifically, my mother hated this friend. Her waking up would have been a bad end to the night. Being as late as it was and getting colder outside, we decided we'd go hang inside and hang out in that room. I guess, because I was hanging out with my friend and was in a good mood, I didn't even think twice about us hanging out in there. I opened the door and I'm about to step inside when I noticed that there was something in the bed. The light from the hallway didn't light up the whole room, but there was enough light to clearly see about 75% of the bed from the foot of the bed upwards. The blanket was pulled about halfway up, but I could clearly see someone's legs under the blanket. This thing was lying on its side. The half that wasn't covered, I saw a person, again, lying on their side, their torso and their head covered in long, dark hair. This room used to be my youngest of three older sisters' room, but at the time, she was living in another city with my dad. I backed out of the room, terrified. My friend saw me, then passed by me to enter the room. He quickly stopped, turned around quietly, and whispered, I thought your sister was living with your dad. I replied, that's not my sister. And he immediately registered what that meant, before also backing away from the door. We both ended up spending the night standing on the balcony, smoking, half terrified, half. Ha ha, that was impossible, right? And what had happened? One thing that is probably unrelated, but still funny I should mention. My cat, the one who is beside me during that visit, died two months after that happened. The vet couldn't tell us why he was sick probably only because we couldn't afford to pay for multiple tests, but he wasted away and died within days of first appearing sick. It was probably just a coincidence. The last thing I can remember happened during a game I started to play with my friends. At the time, I figured out that if you stand in a completely dark room, let your eyes adjust to the darkness completely, then flick the lights on and off, very quickly, you'll see an afterimage of the room burnt into your vision. If you don't try to look at anything, just keep looking straight, the image can last quite a while. This works even better in front of a mirror, as you'll see yourself, and, as was the case in our house, if the mirror in front of you is long, you can really see a lot of the room. I was showing a friend of mine this trick, and we were in the bathroom on the basement floor of my house. I was standing by the door, hand on the light switch. To my left was my friend, to his left was the rest of the bathroom. I flicked the light on and off very quick, and in seconds, sure enough, the bathroom appeared around us. Me by the door, him to the left, beside him the rest of the bathroom. We were giggling at this, especially him as it was his first time doing something like this. Again, I flicked. The room appears beside us. Me. Him. The entire bathroom. I do it once more. The room appears. First I focus on myself. Then on him. Then on the person standing beside him. As far as I can remember, it was not only beside him, but facing him and looking down at him. Both of us were screaming as we left the bathroom. He kept asking me, did you see that person? And in retrospect, I guess he was in a state of shock, though I wouldn't have known to consider such a thing at that age of my life. It's really quite funny thinking back on all of this and considering how, at this point of my life, I think ghosts are a ridiculous notion. If someone tells me about a place that's known to be haunted, I kind of just laugh inside, thinking how dumb that is. You could say, I almost don't even believe ghosts are real. I'm almost entirely skeptical of their very presence. On the other hand, 
I remember all of these events. Some of them even come up in conversation with my sisters. The kind of, holy shit, you remember that conversation piece that occurs and kills the conversation at the same time. I guess you really have to believe in ghosts for them to be real, and my lack of belief has resulted in me living a life since then, since my mother's place, that nothing supernatural has happened in. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Quinta Siegel Shirley Porch Taylor Ruist Annalisa Petrie Jasmine Davis Janelle Jensen Jasper Roth Alex Monica Levelais James Gargano Sarah P Fire 05 Mad as a Felter Tierra Sanders Melissa Kingery Kitty Cat Luna 2 Chelsea Moffat Ryan Gabrielle Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sara Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Op, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Adwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindop, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zaffirano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicki Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.